Is it a meteor shower? Space debris? No, it's something much, much worse. Our nearest neighbor is a full moon no more. The moon exploded and splintered into millions of fragments. Enormous lunar rocks are hurling toward Earth. Could this wipe us off the face of the planet? How could the moon explode in the first place? And if we do survive, how would losing the moon change life as we know it? This is What If? And here's what would happen if the moon exploded. Okay, so how on Earth did the moon blow up? A blast mining operation gone wrong? A nuclear blast? A collision with a rogue planet? Whatever caused this catastrophe, you'd have to be packing some serious firepower to blow up the moon. Guns. Lots of guns. The largest nuclear bomb ever built, the Tsar Bomba, had the energy of over 57 million tons of TNT. Think that's strong enough? It's just a drop in the ocean compared to the amount of force you'd need to blow up the moon. You'd need the power of over 600 billion Tsar Bombas to destroy the moon. With anything less than that, the moon would just crack into pieces and its gravity would pull it back together again. But if someone or something managed to explode the moon, uh, it would spell bad news for us. The moon debris would scatter across the solar system, some into the abyss of outer space, and some headed straight for Earth. Earth's gravitational pull would immediately start to attract the moon rocks. As the moon's remains start to pick up speed, they would come crashing down into the atmosphere. Luckily, most of the smaller debris would burn up before it reaches us. Any larger pieces that got through would be traveling much slower than a similar-sized asteroid. The damage they'd cause wouldn't amount to much. But is it just me or is it getting a little hot in here? The moon chunks aren't causing much damage, but the endless barrage of debris on our atmosphere would start to heat up the Earth. The whole world would start to get hotter and hotter, eventually getting to the point of incinerating all life. Talk about a bad way to go. Oh, and if you're thinking about trying to evacuate Earth, you better do it as soon as possible. The moon debris combined with all the satellites it would destroy in space would make any trip out nearly impossible. But what if you did manage to get out of Dodge or hunker down in the deepest parts of the Earth? What would life be like in the aftermath? Well, for some of us, it wouldn't get any cooler. The moon helps stabilize the Earth's axial tilt. It's what gives us seasons. With a new tilt, some parts of the Earth could be constantly exposed to the sun. In the worst case, the polar regions could start rapidly melting, raising sea levels, and drowning out parts of the world. As the debris settles, the skies could look a little different. The remaining moon rock might cluster around the Earth, forming a giant ring like Saturn. But don't stop and stare too long. Every once in a while, some of the debris could rain down onto the Earth. Over billions of years, the moon's gravitational pull slowed down the Earth's rotation, giving us our 24-hour days. Without the moon, the Earth would start to rotate faster and faster. We'd have shorter days and stronger winds. Birds and insects would have a tough time surviving the harsh winds. Not only that, ocean tides would start to die down into tiny little waves. The moon's gravity helps create tides on Earth. Bummed out that you can't rip some gnarly waves anymore? Well, dude, there'll be a much bigger problem. It would wipe out all of the sea creatures that rely on the tides and ocean currents for survival. Our whole world would be literally flipped upside down. 
the Earth would burn up, our days would be shorter, and the moon wouldn't be there to light up the night sky. So enjoy the view while it lasts. The moon's surface is made up of long dead volcanoes and impact craters from asteroids. But have you ever wondered what might be inside it? We could find out one day by digging a tunnel through the moon. How long would this take? What mysteries would we find inside? And how would gravity affect our dig? This is What If, and here's what would happen if we dug a tunnel through the moon. Unlike the Earth's layers, we don't know much about what's inside our moon. But we do know to get through it, you'd need to dig over 3,000 kilometers. And with today's technology, doing something like this would take about 1,300 years. But what if we managed to fast forward this with more advanced technology? What would happen then? To start our journey through the moon, we'd first want to choose an area that would give us a head start. The best choice here would be the South Pole Aitken Basin. This is a massive basin that's eight kilometers deep. For comparison, the deepest hole on Earth is 12.2 kilometers, so this would save us a lot of time. Now it's time to start digging. The first layer you'd need to worry about would be the moon's regolith, also known as the moon's outer crust. It may not seem like it at first, but this layer is surprisingly dangerous. Regolith is billions of years of crushed asteroids and moon dust. It's razor sharp and very fine and can easily get into your suit and your drill, which will wear them down over time. And make sure you don't accidentally inhale any of this stuff as it can cause lung cancer. You'll be digging through the regolith layer for up to 15 meters until you reach the lunar crust. This layer is made up of bedrock and it's where you might make some money since rocks in the crust contain lots of titanium and aluminum. You'll also be able to find iron, calcium and magnesium. We could either bring these back to Earth or use them to help us colonize the moon. This layer is about 100 kilometers deep. Once you're through it, you'll then have to deal with the lithosphere. This layer used to be magma that would supply the moon's volcanoes, but thankfully it's cooled and is now solid. What we'd be less thankful for is that this layer is nearly 1,000 kilometers deep, so you'd keep drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling until you've finally reached the asthenosphere. What's different here? is that this layer is made up of molten lava. At this point, your journey would definitely be over, as you'll be facing temperatures of up to 1500 degrees. But we'll give you a special suit to help you survive this. Oh, and a special drill, too. Now, you wouldn't be drilling at this point. Instead, you'd be trying to swim your way through this magma. And as you get past this, you'll be met with another liquid. But this time, it will be liquid iron, which is the outer layer of the moon's core. Its radius is roughly 330 kilometers, so let's hope your suit can still withstand the immense heat. And as you drill your way through these thousands of kilometers, you'll notice that the gravity has been changing. As you reach the center of the moon, the gravity will reach zero and you'll be completely weightless, floating in the moon's inner core made of solid iron. So, now that you've reached the center, it's time to make your way back out. Through the outer core, out through the asthenosphere, then the lithosphere, inner crust, and finally the regolith layer. And drilling through wouldn't take as long as it did the first time. That's because the inner crust is about 40 kilometers thinner on this side of the moon, which is the side that faces the Earth. Digging through the moon has some benefits, but overall it wouldn't be worth it. After all, this project would take 1300 years, and who wants to wait that long? 
The moon has been our friendly neighbor in the sky for billions of years. It's guided us home, kept us on time, protected us, propelled us into space, and has even launched dance crazes. It's hard to fathom what we would do without it, but for the sake of science, let's try to envision a moonless world. What would happen to Earth? Would humans still exist? And what would life be like? This is What If, and here's what would happen if the moon had never formed. So how exactly did we get a moon in the first place? Scientists believe it started off with a splash. The giant impact hypothesis, also known as the big splash, theorizes that a Mars-sized celestial object named Thea came crashing into Earth four and a half billion years ago, tossing vaporized particles of Earth's crust into space. At this point, Earth was still a baby, only 30 to 50 million years old and not much more than molten lava. Some scientists call this early Earth Gaia. Over time, the debris of Gaia and Thea joined together in a dance with Earth's gravity and formed the moon we know and love today. And lucky for us, our moon's orbit and gravitational pull tilt the Earth 23.4 degrees, creating tidal bulges that help slow the rotation of our planet just enough for life to safely exist. Or so we think. Despite a popular theory, having a moon is no longer a requirement for life to exist. So. Could we really exist without our moon? How would we survive? Well, with a little gravitational help from our friends the Sun and Jupiter, life could still have evolved without a moon. But how? Well, with no moon to keep the Earth on an even keel, things might get a little wobbly. We'd have to put up with some extreme weather, our concept of time and seasons would drastically change, and we may evolve to look short and stubby. You can learn more about this in our other video, What If We Lost the Moon? There is, however, another hypothesis. In a study conducted at the NASA Ames Research Center in 2011, scientists performed complex simulations in which the Earth didn't have its moon and measured the effects on Earth's spin over time. The results were shocking. They discovered that the Earth's wobble would eventually stabilize due to Jupiter's immense gravitational pull, deviating no more than 10 degrees off its axis. Thanks, Jupiter! Scientists have also found that the Earth might have spun backward before the Moon formed. This would mean that the Sun would rise in the west and set in the east. Feeling dizzy yet? Our sky would be a lot darker than usual without the moon to reflect the light of the sun, but that would be perfect for stargazing. Mind you, we'd still have a little bit of light from Venus to help light our way in the dark, but the moon is 2,000 times brighter. At the very least, we wouldn't have to put up with wolves keeping us awake at night. Farmers would have to be careful with their crops without a harvest moon, and women's menstrual cycles would change. Despite these conditions, there's a lot more to our moon than just pure science. Without it, our whole idea of the universe could change dramatically, slowing our progress as a species. If it weren't for Italian astronomer Galileo's discovery of the moon's spherical shape in 1609, we'd probably still think the Earth was the center of the universe. Houston. An idea proposed by Aristotle in 284 BCE that was widely accepted for over 1500 years. Our moon was instrumental in launching the space race, which propelled humans to the stars. In the words of Neil Armstrong, going to the moon was one, small step for man. one giant leap for mankind. What if our moon had a twin? Seeing not just one, but two of these satellites in the night sky might be spectacular. But how would the second moon affect the ocean tides? Would months on Earth become longer or shorter? And would these two satellites inevitably collide to cause a massive explosion? This is What If, 
And here's what would happen if the Earth had two moons. Despite what you think, the Earth isn't really the monogamous type. Along with the moon, Earth has another moon-like companion, a small asteroid wandering around it. But it's so far and so small that it can only be considered a quasi-satellite to our planet. In our scenario, we're talking two real moons, just like the Earth had during its formative period. Yep, we likely had two satellites once. Both of them formed when a Mars-sized protoplanet slammed into Earth and shattered into small pieces. So what exactly would happen if the Earth had another moon parked in orbit around it? Let's assume our second moon would be around 1,000 kilometers wide and about 1 30th the mass of our current moon. It would be about the same distance from Earth too, just like the sister satellite our moon had 4.5 billion years ago. Would we see this double moon from Earth? Absolutely. The second moon would just appear about three times smaller. Still, it would be a spectacular view. Along with two moons would come some big tides. The newly captured moon would have a much smaller tidal effect than that of our moon, but the tidal force from both satellites combined would make waves, literally. Although those waves would be bigger, they wouldn't be devastatingly big. In the end, I think surfers will be pretty happy. The second moon might stay in Earth's orbit for tens of millions of years, until eventually, as the moon retreated further from the Earth, it would destabilize the other moon's orbit. Then, just like they did over four billion years ago, the two satellites would collide in slow motion. Because they'd be moving slowly towards each other, the debris from the collision wouldn't shower back on Earth. The small moon would splatter itself across our moon as an extra layer of solid crust. The new mountains of crushed rock visible from the near side of our moon would be the only reminders of its existence. Now, what if the second satellite happened to be the same size as the moon and orbited the Earth at half the lunar distance? This time, things wouldn't be so pretty. The second moon alone would produce tides eight times greater than what we see right now. That would force people away from the coastal areas because the difference between high and low tides would now reach 300 meters. Constant tidal flooding would shrink the habitable area on Earth, but once we adapted to this new world, we'd get to enjoy a beautiful double moon. This time, the second satellite would look bigger from Earth due to its closer orbit. The moons would also have different phases, which means we'd have to come up with another way to measure a month. And then there's some worse news. The two moons would be slowly moving away from Earth and eventually would crash into each other. This collision would send debris back to Earth. It would be a shower of meteorites of epic proportion, and it could wipe us out entirely. Whatever debris didn't fall to Earth would form yet another new moon in Earth's orbit. Imagine living on the moon. You'd have the best view of Earth. You'd enjoy bouncing around at zero gravity and living your life as an astronaut explorer. Doesn't that sound nice? Except living on the moon won't be like this at all. So what would it be like to actually live on the moon? Who will establish a base first? And why would moon dust be your biggest problem? This is what if, and here's what would happen if we settled on the moon. Let's make this clear. Just like America did in 1969, humans will land on the moon again in the next decade. Only this time, it's expected to be more permanent. What's less clear is exactly which country will be the first to land and establish a base. China, the USA, Russia, and India are all making strong efforts to get there. But there are also private companies, including SpaceX and Blue Origin, that have a lot more money to spend on going to the moon. But wait, why exactly are these companies doing this in the first place? Apart from exploring the galaxy and breaking new ground, there's another huge reason these groups all want to be the first to create a base on the moon. And that reason is money. 
The moon is chock full of different resources. It has gold, silver, and titanium in it. The idea here is to mine these precious resources and send them back to Earth. Another resource the moon has is helium-3. It's incredibly rare here on Earth, but not on the moon. That's because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, and helium-3 comes from the sun's radiation. Over billions of years, the moon has been absorbing this chemical, and lucky for us, it can be used for energy. Helium-3 is so powerful that just 100 kilograms of it could power the city of Dallas, Texas for an entire year. Oh, and it's also worth a cool $40,000 for just 28 grams of the stuff. With these resources holding incredible value, it's no secret these countries and companies want to be the first to establish a base. But even if they do, they won't really own it. Back in 1967, the United Nations decided that no one can really own space. This has the potential to cause huge tensions between various nations, possibly leading to war. But enough about all that drama. You are on the moon. So, how exactly are you going to live here? Assuming we get to the moon in one piece, which is already an incredibly difficult task on its own, you'll then have to worry about establishing a base. Experts suggest that we live on the moon's south pole, as it gets the most consistent amount of sunlight. There are also massive fields of ice that we'll be able to harvest. Some other places on the moon don't get any sunlight for nearly a month at a time. Luckily, you'll have robots to help you establish a base. There are many different ways they'll be able to help. One includes using moon soil to construct bricks and configuring them in a dome-like fashion. Sort of like a moon glue. This would make traveling to the moon a lot cheaper, as we wouldn't have to bring everything from Earth to make our base. But don't expect this base to be glamorous. It'll most likely be several meters underground to protect you from the sun's radiation. And as for what you'll eat? Well, it'll be your standard dry astronaut food. The good news is that you should be able to grow some carrots and tomatoes. A 2014 Dutch study found that it's possible using soil on the moon. And what would you drink? Unfortunately, quite a lot of it will be your recycled pee as drinking water won't be available on the moon and it would be too heavy to ship there. Another thing you'll need to seriously worry about is moon dust. This magnetic dust gets everywhere. It'll get on your suit and even on your skin. Previous astronauts have had allergic reactions to it. It's also slightly sharp, so accidentally swallowing any would be a huge problem. But it's not just humans who need to worry about moon dust. It can get into machines as well, causing them to overheat. Before we settle on the moon, this is one massive problem we'll need to solve. All these issues beg the question, would you ever really want to be the first to settle on the moon? You'd most likely spend your time mining and just surviving, with little time to run around in low gravity. And besides, we all know that going here is just our first baby step to get to Mars. So maybe you should just wait for that. What if the moon suddenly began getting closer to Earth? To the point where it was on a collision course with our planet? Would Earth survive the crash? Or would a crash even happen? Would the moon get torn up by Earth's gravity? What would this crumbled up moon look like from Earth? This is what if. And here's what would happen if the moon fell to Earth. The moon is Earth's only natural satellite and the largest object to brighten our night sky. It's the first and only place beyond Earth where humans have set foot. The moon's gravitational pull causes tides on Earth. Tides that might have been the encouragement for life in our oceans to move on land. This pull also keeps Earth from wobbling on its axis, making our climate relatively stable. In short, the moon makes Earth a more livable place. So, what if it suddenly sped up and started driving in Earth's direction? The moon's plan to destroy Earth by bumping into it would break into pieces the moment it reaches the Roche limit. The moon itself would shatter, never making it to Earth's surface. And that's going to look very impressive. But wait, what is this Roche limit? In celestial mechanics, it's the point at which the gravity holding a satellite together is weaker than the tidal forces trying to pull it apart. In other words, 
The moon can only get as close as 18,470 kilometers away from our planet before boom, the tidal forces would tear it apart. All of the footprints and flags we've left on the moon, all of its craters and valleys would scatter to form a breathtaking ring of debris above Earth's equator, 37,000 kilometers in diameter, making Earth the second planet in the solar system after Saturn to have this striking ring of beauty. The difference being that our rings wouldn't last long. The chunks of our former satellite, the moon, would rain down on Earth. It would be as if hundreds of thousands of asteroids were falling down on us and wiping out entire cities in the process. Once the moon began its trajectory towards the planet, it would increase the tidal impact it has on us. By the time it hit the Roche limit, it would be causing tides as high as 7,600 meters. Our world would be devastated by an army of tsunamis 10 times a day. But for a short time, hardcore surfers would enjoy riding some tasty waves. On the other hand, this might be a solution to global warming. With the moon coming closer and closer, Earth's rotation would speed up. Our days would become shorter and shorter. Global temperatures would go down and no one would worry about climate change anymore. Unless asteroids burned the Earth to a crisp, then there would be no one to worry about anything. I really wouldn't worry about it anyway. In fact, the moon is drifting away from us at a rate of four centimeters per year. So it's unlikely we'll get to see those pretty Saturn-like rings here on Earth. What if we humans could live somewhere outside of Earth? Say the moon. Obviously, we can't just pack our stuff and move there today. But what if we terraformed it, reshaped it into Earth's image? How long would it take us to turn our natural satellite into a habitable place? What would this Earth moon look like? Would this even be possible? This is what if, and here's what would happen if we terraformed the moon. Wondering why we chose the moon and not Mars? With water ice buried beneath its surface, the red planet seems to be the best candidate to serve as our second Earth. But with zero experience terraforming, we should consider colonizing our natural satellite first. It gets twice as much sunlight as Mars, and it's just a three-day trip from us. In short, it would take us less time and money to construct a decent Earth on our moon. So, how exactly do we engineer a habitable planet? Just to be clear, we're not talking about building a permanent moon base. We'd go nuts and actually transform the moon into an Earth, just a smaller one. For starters, we'd need to build an atmosphere. And here's the fun part. To do that, we'd need to bombard our moon with 100 water ice comets, ice droids. We'd find them flying all around the Earth. These comets would crash into the moon's surface. They'd fill the moon's plains with water and disperse carbon dioxide along with water vapor and a little bit of ammonia and methane. All these gases would gather near the surface, creating an atmosphere. The newly formed seas would reflect much more sunlight, making the moon appear five times brighter when seen from Earth. These ice droids would also give the moon a momentum. They'd make our satellite spin close to an Earth-like cycle. The more comets we batter into the moon, the faster it would rotate. A lunar day would drop down from an incredible 28 Earth days to just 60 hours. Since our satellite wouldn't rotate on its axis at the same rate it orbits the Earth anymore, it would no longer be tidally locked to our planet. For Earthers, this would mean we'd be able to see the dark side of the moon, although it wouldn't be dark. But how do we save the newly built lunar atmosphere from being stripped away by solar winds? We'd have a couple of options. The first one is easy. Moon's own rotation would generate a dynamo effect. That dynamo could awaken the moon's once active magnetic field that would keep the atmosphere in place. If that doesn't work out, we'd have to place a gigantic shield in orbit. That shield would work as an artificial bow shock, making up for a missing magnetic field. When that's all sorted, we'd bring in genetically engineered plants, suitable for growing on the moon's stony ground. We'd also drop some algae that would release oxygen into the air. That would be the start of life on the moon. Finally, after many decades of hard and costly work, we'd send the first human colony to settle down on the first man-made planet. The terraformed moon would get very warm from greenhouse effects. It would be mostly cloudy too, and with tides as high as 20 meters, surfers might want to make the trip. Living on the moon would be just like living in Florida, but with one-sixth of the Earth's gravity. The moon settlers would be able to jump as high as three meters off the ground, remaining in the air for four seconds. And if they were really fit and full of stamina, they'd be able to run across the moon's lake. The moon is a giant rock that lights up our night and can even change colors. So what would we do without it? Would we all need night vision goggles? How would it affect the ocean tides, our seasons, or our sleep cycles? Or would the consequences be far more dramatic? 
This is what if, and here's what would happen if we suddenly had no moon. As the closest celestial body to our planet, the moon exerts a gravitational pull that governs much of what happens here on Earth. Take the sea, for example. If you like surfing, you can thank the moon. When the moon's gravitational pull tugs on our spinning Earth, the oceans respond, giving us high tides in some parts of the world and low tides elsewhere. And while the wind gives the waves their energy, tides define their shape. The moon's gravitational attraction also keeps us at a stable 23.5 degree tilt relative to the sun, giving us four seasons and a livable climate. But what if that livable climate were to suddenly become unlivable? With the moon gone, its stabilizing effect on the Earth's rotation would go with it. Want the good news first? The weekend just got a whole lot closer. If the moon suddenly disappeared, a day on Earth would only be six to eight hours long. Over millions of years, shifting tides and their pressure on the Earth's continents have slowed our planet's rotation, giving us 24-hour days. But without the moon's strong gravitational influence, the world would spin three to four times faster than it does now. Here comes the bad news. Rotating at that speed, we would experience winds up to 480 kilometers per hour. Birds and insects would have no chance of survival. The luckiest land-based organisms would either be deeply rooted plants or very short, very stout animals. Most of our marine life would be wiped out since sea creatures that rely on ocean currents for survival would lose the privilege of the ocean's pull. Currents help circulate vital nutrients from the ocean floor to the surface, while dragging oxygen-rich surface water deep into the sea. We'd still have tides, but now they'd be governed by the sun, and from a distance of 93 million miles away, they'd only be one-third as powerful. And with the moon suddenly out of the way, the oceans would rip towards the sun, causing catastrophic waves, killing thousands and submerging coastlines. At this point, we'd have to adjust to new ocean currents, which, circulating at a slower rate, would be heating up equatorial waters while turning polar waters frigid. These extreme differences would produce a similar effect on land as well, since ocean temperatures influence their regional climates. Along with the Sun, Mars and other nearby planets could also claim a share of gravitational influence over our planet, pulling Earth in different directions and causing it to tilt with increased volatility. Earth's axial plane would vary some 10 degrees, causing dramatic shifts in seasons and rendering our climate uninhabitable. Most crops would die with the drastic temperature changes. We'd experience the worst ice ages known to man, as huge glaciers from the North and South Poles would encroach upon the Earth, covering everything except perhaps a small band across the equator. So while full moons may attract werewolves, that's still better than an alternative world where the moon doesn't exist. Buckle up! We're going to take the orbit of this rock and kick it into high gear. Behold, the moon breaking its planetary speed limit. How would this event flood cities? What would happen to the Earth's crust? And why would the moon go rogue? This is what if, and here's what would happen if the moon orbited Earth faster. The moon orbits around our blue marble of a planet at a comfortable and reliable speed of one kilometer per second. And if that seems fast to you, well, hold on, you haven't seen anything yet. So how could this happen? If the moon kept getting closer to Earth, the gravitational pull from our planet would increase. That would make the moon's orbit speed up tremendously. That's the basis for Kepler's third law. So if the moon kept creeping toward Earth, it would orbit faster and faster. And if that happened, how would this event freeze the planet? Every 27 days, the moon completes a trip around Earth. Well, not anymore. Get ready to see this celestial body more often. And with the moon's increased visibility and speed, lunar eclipses would be a regular sight. But that lovely view in the sky wouldn't make up for the hell on Earth below. If the moon moved closer, the gravitational pull would rip into the Earth's crust. This increased force would create earthquakes and increase volcanic eruptions across the globe. And don't 
think you could cool off by the ocean to escape the heat. Let me explain. The oceans ebb and flow thanks to the moon's orbit, the Earth's gravity, and the sun. So as the moon inches closer, the ocean tides would become much larger. How large are we talking? They would be eight times higher than average. Coastal cities would flood and some islands would become blanketed underwater for most of the day. Almost 700 million people living in low-lying coastal areas would be in constant danger if they weren't evacuated. But what would happen if the moon started to move even faster? Well, remember Kepler's third law. The moon would only orbit faster if it got closer. Now, if it came within 18,470 kilometers, it would reach what's called the Roche limit. That's the point where the moon is so close to Earth that the tidal forces between us would get strong enough to tear this gray rock apart. Thankfully, this wouldn't be able to happen because as its speed increased, our moon would be launched into the cosmos. Yeah, that's because once our natural satellite reached 1.4 kilometers per second, it would have enough momentum to escape Earth's gravity. As it fades from sight, you might feel relieved at first. After all, the Earth's rotation would slow down without the moon, so days would become longer. And finally, you'd see an end to the constant earthquakes and devastating floods. But in reality, this is where the real nightmare begins. The tides would become smaller and weaker without the moon. Any coastal ecosystems that weren't already destroyed by the massive flooding would now be completely upended. Without churning tides, animals that depend on food sources normally floating in the ocean wouldn't get the nutrients they need to live. And without the moon's light, nocturnal predators would have difficulty completing a successful hunt. This could create a mass extinction event of creatures on land and at sea. And while life on Earth would be flipped on its ear, so would the planet. Earth has a tilt of about 23 and a half degrees. This angle of its orbit makes the seasons possible. But it's the moon's gravity that stabilizes this tilt from going any further. So without it, the seasons could stop. Weather patterns might hold in place until the end of time. But if the tilt increased, well, it could cause extreme weather conditions and once again, the Earth could be plunged into an ice age. Yeah, a faster lunar orbit could fast track all life on Earth to extinction. No, that's not Photoshop. That's an actual video from the International Space Station of the Moon looking a bit squished. Wow. So, what happened here? Is the cover-up behind a flat moon an elaborate government conspiracy? How would this affect the oceans? What would happen to our climate? And could the moon fly out into space? This is what if, and here's what would happen if the moon was flat. In 2010, an astronaut on the International Space Station observed a bizarre phenomenon. When he glanced out the window, he saw the moon looked flattened when it appeared in the thickest part of the Earth's atmosphere. And those of you in the Flat Earth Society, don't at me, it's not flat. High above the planet, the air bends light to give the moon this squished look in these very specific conditions. But if the moon were flat, it would explain why we never see the mysterious dark side. And if this was our reality, how would this affect gravity on Earth? Okay, there are no illusions this time. The moon is flat. 
So, how would that happen? Well, a celestial body would need to spin incredibly fast to become a flat disk. So fast that it would rip into tiny pieces before it would ever have a chance to form. For our purposes, let's say the moon survived this process and formed like a plate. Would this flat moon have the same mass as what we see right now? Well, as a flat disk, the moon could have 25% of the thickness, but the width might remain the same. With so much less mass floating above the Earth, the change in ocean tides could be the first noticeable effect. The moon's gravitational pull generates these tides. Our moon pulls the water on the side of the Earth that's closest to it, but this flat moon would have less mass and less gravitational effect on our planet. And the altered tides would affect more than just surfers. Ocean tides stir up material below the water's surface, allowing coastal ecosystems to thrive. Without the usual strong waves, animal life in the oceans, like crabs, mussels, and snails, could die off in mass numbers. This chain reaction could decimate life worldwide. And that's not all a flat moon would ruin. Remember, the tides also push water back and forth around the planet. When warm waters travel from one area to another, these tidal forces change weather patterns globally. Without the strong tides, we could experience extreme temperature changes. But even with all these devastating changes, the climate still wouldn't change as fast as the days. The moon's mass influences our planet's rotation, giving us a 24-hour day. But with a flat moon, the day could be only 15 hours long. But I think most of us could live with a five-hour workday. And while we'd get more sunlight, the nights would be even darker. You see, the moon reflects the sunlight to give off that bright glow we all know and love. A smaller moon would reflect less light, making it much dimmer. That would make it harder for nocturnal animals that rely on the moon for navigation and hunting. But maybe none of that would matter since it could potentially crash right into us. Wait, what? Yeah, the Earth and the Moon are locked together in an eternal dance. The motion created by one affects the other. I know, this sounds hippy-dippy, but trust me, we're talking science here. The same tidal forces that move the oceans also affect the Moon's orbit. The tidal bulges in the ocean rotate faster than the Moon orbits the Earth, and this rotation takes energy away from the Earth and transfers that into the Moon's orbit. This is called tidal friction and causes the Moon to drift away from us at the rate of 3.82 centimeters every year. A flat Moon with less mass would orbit closer to our planet. So maybe it wouldn't slam into Earth, but our view of celestial phenomena wouldn't be the same. Right now, the Sun and Moon are positioned just perfectly that, when aligned, we get a spectacular image of a total eclipse on Earth. The Moon covers the Sun entirely in this breathtaking event. A squished Moon wouldn't be able to block out the Sun entirely during an eclipse, and we would see the top and bottom of the Sun peeking out. A flat moon could destroy the balance of life on Earth and threatens every ecosystem and living organism, including humans. Greetings, future, uh, moonling? Yeah, that's right. You are among the first generation of children born on the moon. How would your birth compare to every previous human's? Would your body be physically different from an earthling's? 
And what challenges would you face if you traveled to Earth? This is What If. And here's what would happen if you were born on the moon. If you were born on the moon, you'd begin your life 384,400 kilometers away from where every other human being has ever been born. At least as far as we know. The surface of your birthplace would have an extremely thin atmosphere without liquid water. The radiation levels could be up to 1,000 times higher than on Earth's surface, and the scorching daytime temperatures at the equator get as high as 120 degrees and as frigid as minus 130 degrees at night. Of course, your mother wouldn't give birth to you out on the moon's surface. Your life would begin in a state-of-the-art base surrounded by a handful of astronauts. But with six times less gravity than on Earth, would being born on the moon be extremely dangerous? Right now, a moon base is only theoretical. Your first home on the moon might be a habitat based on Project Horizon. It was a concept proposed by the U.S. military in 1959. Whether the base got built into caves using pressurized airbags or a high-tech cylindrical airlock dug into the surface, you'd be born into an incredible self-sustaining habitat. You'd harvest the oxygen you'd breathe and the water you'd drink from the moon's natural environment. Your birth wouldn't have been a walk in the park for your parents, either. Since you'd be the first space baby, there wouldn't be any research on the challenges of conceiving a child in space. But your folks were successful, and uh, you probably wouldn't want to hear much about that anyway. The moon's lower gravity would have made your birth especially challenging. As a fetus, you'd have developed slower, so the length of time your pregnant mother carried you could have been longer than on Earth. Imagine being pregnant in space for up to one full year. Your birth would likely have taken longer than back on Earth, too. For every month your mother has spent in space, she could have lost about 1 to 2 percent of her bone density. That would have made pushing you out a lot more difficult and dangerous. With the risk that giving birth could fracture your mother's pelvic bone, the doctors in your space habitat would have brought you into the world using a C-section operation. And every baby born on the moon after you would likely be born this way, too. This could lead to one of the first big differences between Earth and Moon babies. Our heads evolved to be small enough to fit through the birth canal. So, with no traditional childbirths on the Moon, future Moonlings could evolve to have bigger heads than their Earth counterparts. Moon-born children could even evolve to have different skin color than the folks back on Earth. The melanin in our skin protects us from the sun's radiation. And the darker your skin, the more natural protection you have. But there's no atmosphere on the moon, so you'd live with significantly less protection from radiation. So the skin color of future moonlings could evolve to be extremely dark to provide the protection they'd need. But since a lot of your life would be spent inside a habitat or wearing a spacesuit, well, the opposite could be true. Humans on the moon could evolve to be even paler than some people on Earth. The increased radiation could cause other changes, too. If Earthlings and Moonlings didn't produce enough offspring together, you could even see a new species of humans emerge. Okay, well, that could take a few hundred or even thousands of generations, but you'd have been the starting point in this incredible evolution of humanity. How much you interact with people from Earth would be a tricky question for you. Not enough mingling, and your immune system could weaken. 
you could lose your ability to fight off infections brought to your base by visitors. To be safe, you might minimize your contacts with new astronauts or settlers. The last thing you'd want is to start the first pandemic on the moon. And if you ever made the trip to Earth, you'd find it pretty hard to adapt. First of all, you'd need a week or two just to adjust to the gravity. And you'd be plagued by lightheadedness each time you stood up, since the reflexes that regulate your blood pressure would be accustomed to lunar gravity, not Earth's. Be careful when jumping into any bodies of water, too. You're from a place where you have to live inside and conserve water, so diving could be hard for you. You could get disoriented and accidentally dive deeper instead of returning to the surface. Now, you could find that having a good view of the Earth makes up for the challenges of visiting it. If you live on the near side of the moon, you'd be able to see Earth all the time. Earth would even cast extra light onto you. Yeah, the Earth reflects approximately 37% of the sunlight it receives. So on the moon, your view of the planet could be 43 times brighter than the view an Earthling has looking up at you. Hopefully, you wouldn't grow up to be a light sleeper who needs total darkness. You awake? Yeah. You'd be constantly bathed in both sunlight and earth shine. Well, if that happens, maybe you could move over to the far side of the moon and enjoy its constant darkness. And with such a thin atmosphere, you'd see stars even during the brightest parts of the day. Being born on the moon would come with its pluses and minuses, but would it be even cooler if you were born somewhere else? Like on Mars? Well, that's a story for another What If. shower? Space debris? No, it's something much, much worse. Our nearest neighbor is a full moon no more. The moon exploded and splintered into millions of